Assalamu alaikum, <coughs> good afternoon listeners, it's me Suleiman Ben Suwari coming back on Facebook Live. Uh, today is Friday the 4th of um, uh, February 2022, the time is just gone 25 minutes past 3 in the afternoon in Birmingham, England. If you bear me a minute, let me share this uh, video and the program can start. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as I said, today is um, Friday. Uh, Juma Mubarak to all of you. Assalamu alaikum um, to all of you out there. Uh, the program today is to share my observations um, into the Gambia, Senegal, MFDC crisis, uh, uh, and the MFDC crisis. Uh, what what risk does it pose to our national security? And um, I deliberately avoid the word phony because uh, I, I want to avoid this stereotype as phony is a completely different region of the Gambia or phony is asking for secession or something else. I just say the Gambia and I want it to be seen as that. I want this, I want to address the issue as it is. It's a national issue. It's about the sovereignty of the Gambia. It's about Senegal, our relationship with Senegal, and it's about the MFDC. Uh, MFDC. It's not for me, that's why I said my observations. These are one of the rare moments I come out and say my observation. Obviously, most of my program are my observation, but uh, for one reason, my, um, I was, my um, subconsciously, I was informed to emphasize on this observation. Um, I'm not looking at Casamas as, as, uh, as a separate entity. I'm not looking at Casamas as an independent entity. No. Casamas is part of Senegal. Because I have seen what Salif Sadio is playing at. And that's, that's one of the other reasons I'm coming out and we're going to discuss the, the, what the video of Salif Sadio means. But we start by looking at the issues as Gambians and Gambia and start to look at the issue as of Senegal and the issue as MFDC and Salif Sadio. MFDC and why did I say MFDC Salif Sadio? To understand for people probably that don't understand the history, MFDC is not only Salif Sadio. He have a faction. There are other factions which are technically not active uh, 
in in the in the fight or or, or very dominant and but the the entity that really um border us now is this alisagio entity and i'm not going into history to explain but this is an entity that was empowered by um by um by Yajame, uh, when he was in government and we have to understand that and um we have to understand and appreciate Gambia as a sovereign nation. We cannot and we should not be blinded or any reason make us be complacent and see things differently. Refusing to recognize our sovereignty, our sovereign rights and accepting anybody for that matter, trampling on the sovereignty. This is very important to note. And this would be about nationalism. I'll talk about it in a minute. Important to note that Gambia was created by default from colonialism. Gambia existed before colonialism. But the boundaries of the Gambia is not what the boundaries of the Gambia used to be. But in history, there is no nation in history that maintain its physical or territorial boundaries over 100 years. Things evolve and boundaries will change. Things evolve and boundaries will change. And when we say boundaries change, I'll give an example. The United Kingdom boundary have changed many times and it have changed recently when it joined the EU because now United Kingdom citizens happen to have sovereignty rights into other countries because of the signatory to the EU I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean becoming signatory to the EU and obviously in, in some hundreds of years, United Kingdom was not what it was. Right now, Gambia, it's what we're going on. We are evolving. Gambian territory have been different things in different times. And Gambian territory is surely, as every other territory, be it Senegal, be, be it Guinea Conakry, Mali, or anywhere else, is bound to change, and he, it had changed before. And it's going to change again. It's going to evolve. One thing as people, progressive people, what we do is, we prepare ourselves and be part and prepare ourselves so that when we when the we, we evolve and we manage that evolve men as a nation so that we can guarantee our interest and this interest becomes a mutual interest this is where gambia is with senegal we are in a process and i said when we had our independence we went through a process to gain independence and that independence makes us a sovereign nation. Gambia, we like it or not. Senegal, we like it or not. Guinea Conakry and others like it or, or not. The physical boundaries will change. What will determine that change is up to the people. Some physical boundaries change from what? Warfare. Warfare. Some physical boundaries change through negotiations. I mean, and treaties, agreements, and other things and happen to unions and others happen. As pre progressive nations, then we should manage our affairs in a way and manner where we generously protect our interests, protect our theoretical integrity for a future evolution where our interests would be maintained in a greater good. This is something that we have to understand. Senegal as a nation is going through the same thing. We are equal. Yes. Equal in a sense, as you said, human beings are equal. I'm not saying that our economics are equal. I'm not saying our military equal. I'm not saying our population equal. But in the sense of things, or when we call as a nation, we are counted as a sovereignty, as Senegal is counted sovereignty. Or, or Guinea Conakry, or wherever it is. Or United Kingdom even. What difference do we have is the poverty levels. 
What difference do we have is how we seen in the index of things. Our human development index, in the index of corruption, in the index of where we are, development, and so on. Poverty index, these are the things that makes us different. And our size should, should not be the issue to give us better index than Senegal. No. What gives us better index than Senegal or, or, or Guinea Conakry or Mali or, or, or United Kingdom or wherever it is, it's leadership. Just as Cuba have a better index in certain aspects than the United States. You believe it or not? Uh, or, or, or developed countries. The Scandinavian countries have better, um, as, uh, a better position in the index of a lot of things uh, than, than, than United Kingdom or, 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 or America. You have what we call the masculine and the feminine uh, governance and, 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 uh, and these things, they measure and they tell you that countries that are called feminine uh, in, in a sense are better managed and are more progressive and people live there happier than ever. That's what, what they call the Scandinavian. And, and we see what happened in America and other countries where they call us a masculine kind of governance and, 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 and how things are. Now, the other bit as MFDC we have to understand. We cannot and we should not be mistakenly or whatever be subscribing to a propaganda as if MFDC is representing Casamas or Casamas is a separate, separate entity. In history, Casamas was a, a, a separate entity, just as Gambia was and every, every other country is. We all know how we came through empires and everything else, how we came to colonialism, how demarcations, the, 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 the scramble of Africa. We have had all those history. But at present, we have to recognize what the international law says. As civilized citizens, we have to go by law, accept law. We should not accept anything and be part of anything that is against international law or domestic laws. I mean, philosophically, we might ally ourselves into things. As human beings, we do. We might empathetic to, to people, causes, and everything else. But as, as civilized nations, when it comes to it, we go by law. In this case, what I'm trying to say is, we cannot be falling to the thing as MFDC is representing uh, Casamas. Casamas is represented by their elected leaders. Casamas is under a democracy, and they are electing leaders according to democracy. If customers decide to go through a democratic means to determine an independent state through I mean, a referendum or however they manage to do that democratically, obviously customers will be recognized as an independent nation. Until then, the responsibility as citizens, as a nation, is to recognize Senegal as a full entity and the MFDC as a rebellion, a rebel movement, and how big or small that can be determined by the people responsible in charge of doing those assessment in order to deal with the problem. One other point I need to note before going through is, what does it mean Gambia should not get involved? I am hearing that a lot. What inf inform our involvement? Why Gambia should involve in something? Why Gambia should not involve in something? So, uh, another thing. I give you a different example here. A nation plan their economy. Gambia planning their economy. Gambia cannot plan its economy without not thinking what is happening in Senegal. What is bound to happen in Senegal in 10, 15, 20 years? What is happening in Guinea Conakry? What is, going to is what is happening in Bissau? What is going to happen in other places? Because what happened in those places, the activities that happen in those places, how those places are governed, managed, affects what happened in the Gambia. Because we trade with these countries, and 
and, 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 and transactions, different um, people travel within these countries. We all belong into, uh, we belong signature to, to, to all um, sort of treaties, um, signature to the uh, ECOWAS, signature to and everything else, apart from even saying that we are of one people. We tend to say we and Senegal are of one people, but the entire of West Africa are of one people. Centuries of, I mean, I mean uh, interaction, dependency, governance, and everything. From the empires, you count them to, 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 to whenever the last one ends. But if economically we have to deal with these countries and we have to do our projections, we have to do our calculus and everything uh, looking into how activities into this country, those countries are doing the same thing towards us and to each other. We, we are signing bilateral agreements. <laughs> we are investing into I mean, what we call the ECOWAS corridor, trying to have a road network that connects because of trade and other things. Telecoms and other things that we share. We, we do share a lot. We cannot be an island. A sovereign nation doesn't mean that you are an island of your own. You need the other countries, especially countries right next door to you. Just as the United Kingdom needs, even it's an island, needs the European Union and needs other countries far as, um, as India and China and others, they are a sovereign nation. Gambia, uh, then when we think of we should not get involved, is how much we should get involved or how do we get involved? How much we should get involved and how do we get involved? These are the two things we should ask ourselves. And these two are guided by law. These two are guided by our, you call it development strategy, because of security is part of development strategy. What our security strategy is. What our defense strategy is. What is what our strategy is. This is what should inform how we get involved. What we get involved in. How much we get involved then to say that Gambia should not get involved, it's a no-brainer. Because the crisis in anywhere else, I'll say the crisis in, Ma in Mali today is affecting us, it's going to affect us. The crisis in, 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 in northern Niger is affecting us, it's going to affect us. Yes, the, I mean, the, 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 the magnitude are, are different. Or, the, uh, or, or we might not realize it now, or is something that is going to affect us later. But that's why I said the closer it is, the more it affects us. The closer the crisis is, the more it affects us. Especially crises which are along our borders, involve both nations. Then the problem is our problem. It's not only a Senegalese problem. Yes, the Senegalese have a greater part of it because it's, it's, it's dealing with secession and other insecurities in there, but those insecurities are affecting us. And all Gambians quoting that, or oh, this thing have never happened in the Gambia, uh, rebels have never fought battles within our territory, that's not true. You don't know. Just say that you don't know. It have never happened in the time of Jawara, yes. Why it has never happened in the time of Jawara? Because you, if you understand MFDC and what, her, what they were involved in, they were not big in the time before. They were mainly kind of a more of a political movement. Yeah, they have a kind of a militancy and kind of this thing, but it's more of a decision. They don't have a capacity or anything. And they operated in, within the main centers, Ziganso and orders. And towards the boundaries, towards um, um, I mean, Naka, um, Bissau, because of why the the, the for their own security, the bow, I mean, the territory between uh, uh, Bissau and Sen Senegal was better for them to, I mean, host themselves to be protected and others, because the the territory within Gambia it was not that um, secure. 
but it does not mean that there were no activities within that area of, of customers. But it was not as they had presence in the time of Jawa. And um, in, um, in, 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 in late, uh, in late um, almost in the 1990s, some scams and some issues, what they do is they used to come in and out, uh, I mean, dealing with their logistics and orders to Gambia. I mean, that used to happen. But 1994, except around April, May, the first meeting between the MFDC representative with Jamakon to State House Gambia, it was in May. In the soil of the Gambia, Jamakon, Jamakon, I'm not saying that other I mean, there, there were many. Uh, when I came, there were many that come in at Ogo, but Jamogon himself saying, oh, presence in the Gambia to discourse was in around April and May, which I know of. And that's where the, it, 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 uh, the, it, 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 it grew. Then, obviously, I yeah, invested to use Kasem as, as a proxy and his other ideologies that he wanted to expand. Just as he used Casamas, he used Liberia, he, he, he was involved in the Ivory Coast, he was involved in Guinea-Bissau and others. For his interest, it was not for the interest of any clan or anything, but it might be presented that way, but it was more of his interest and his ego and, 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 and his dreams. It, it escalated. And this escalation around our border, again, this is where, again, the mistake of Senegal, um, Abdu, um, uh, Ablai Wada, invested in a faction. I, I forgot the name of the faction. Faction of, of rebels. Sponsored here. But this is not new. Government did this in, 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 in South America, and they do it in other countries. What they do is to try to split the rebels by supporting factions within the rebels to fight each other. Um, even the Israeli did it with PLO. PLO, most of the faction of PLO, uh, when they start to happen, what do the Israeli intelligence will support factions in order to, to, to weaken the PLO. But it's a dangerous strategy. It's a dangerous strategy. Because you are throwing um, fuel to the fire. Technically, that's what you're doing. It's, it's, it's not ethical and it's dangerous because you don't have control over. And this, Ablai Wade did, obviously, and, 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 and why Ablai Wade did that was to, to, to use those I mean, rebels' factions to fight the faction that the IMO was supporting, that's uh, the faction of Salif Sajjah and others. That's why, as citizens, we should hold government accountable. Be it Senegalese government, with be it Gambia government. Let them do ethical things, let them do right things, let them do, do things um, by, uh, by uh, the, 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 the due process of the law. And so many mistakes were done. And again, another thing too, there was a lot of corruption within the Senegalese army, exaggerating some of the events happening within Casamas in order to attract more investment in the army, and investment, more investment in the army is investment in their pockets. And this too is not new. It has happened in many theaters of war. In Afghanistan itself, the billions you hear about Afghanistan, most of it did not go to Afghanistan or the projects in Afghanistan. It was siphoned by politicians and senior military operatives and other handlers. This is the nature of corruption. But in, in Kasamas, this is why it happened. And we had, had rebels to block, block. I don't know people know block, just the call it fringes of Combo. I think that's the border of Combo. And, and a, a villages around there, silly areas, villages around there. The rebels have been around there, they have fought around there. And they have literature and orders. And other things have happened. It's not new. Then, that's why I said, how Gambia get involved? 
it, it's de determined by what we do or how we do it or what we will do. But these things were bound to uh, be around. We have a role to play as a sovereign nation, but within our sovereignty and within the guideline of what, what our security strategy, our defense um, I mean policies, and so on. It has to be within that framework. Another point I need to touch before we move over is nationalism. Nationalism. Very loaded thought. And what uh, something that's been misused. As every, almost anything, people can make it to what they want it to be. But what do you understand about it? What did you make of it? What does it represent for you? People be proud to say, I'm nationalistic. And in a good way, saying that it can be used as a negative term to say that, oh, he is neo uh, it's nationalistic. This is as if you have a prejudice against like a xenophobia or prejudice against certain things or elements. It can be seen in that way. And in this sense, we all should be nationalists. Every citizen should be. Just as, as when you said to citizens should be patriotic, to have love of country, to try your best to live within the laws of the country, to try your best to, to be a moral citizen. Try your best to always do things to create a, be the part of creating a greater good. Restrain yourself where you, I mean, I mean, where danger is or where danger can be caused. We should all be that. But does not mean that we accept people to label us. We should understand what it means and live by that. We should not be silent in fear of being labeled and nationalist. It's just like when we silence in fear that we'll tell uh, someone who said that we don't love our tribe. You are not proud of your tribe. Because of you, you restrain in knowing that you're supposed to restrain in this situation. Because speaking out or doing something about it or what they expect you to say or do, it's not what it's right to do. They will label you, uh, I mean, you are not part of your tribe. Or you're doing something about it, but they don't want or like or they don't approve of what you do or the way you're doing it about your tribe. Probably you're holding yourself and your tribe accountable. They call you what? You don't love your tribe. You don't love, you love your tribe, then I'm complex. You're trying to appease others. There might be some people that will do that. I do, down deep you, down deep inside you, you should know whether you're appeasing someone or not. Or you're doing it, doing something with the side. I know people will try to say no, no. If I say this, people see this way and I'm anti senegalese I am anti-foreigners and anti-this. We should not be quiet. If we are certain that, that we need to speak out or we have something substance to speak out about, which is right to, to defend, defend a nar narrative. It starts from defending a narrative before you can defend your people or defend your sovereignty. It's a narrative being self us. Anything, action before it happened, in most cases is... is, is it's, it's been campaigned for. It's been, I mean, I mean, I mean, message in order for it to, to I mean, I mean, I mean, to be able to be used. If we are strategic, if we use um, our minds to fight that narrative, we might not get to where actions would be necessary. We will have this this escalated. That's why I said that times the intervention you do is to dis escalate the situation. Not leave things to start to pile up and a narrative will be formed and that narrative end up harming us. And if 
You believe that there are a lot of idiots in the town hall behaving in a way and manner and you think that the only solution is to be quiet. You are doing something very dangerous. That silence means that it's an approval to those idiots for what they represent. It will come a time you should be counted to avoid that narrative, that idi those idiots, the narrative they're giving out. Out of ignorance, out of grievances, out of disgruntledness, out of whatever the reason they're doing it for, you should speak out. I mean, if you believe in what you say, that this is, these are things that need to be said. It's the same as if you have an incompetent government or systems, and if I say systems, I mean the government and, and, and other sectors, other sectors that comp um, comprises of governance, ineffective, and we have idiots in our midst, and you, you believe to be a progressive and stand back and let this incompetent government uh, continue to do what they do and this idiot's finding of, uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the fire, you are complicit. You are complicit. There are people who are just ignorant. They are ignorant. They are idiots. They are bigots. They are whatever it is. We have them in every society. There are not many, but they can be very effective in impacting something very bad, especially if the others are quiet. The only voice that you hear would be them. Just go to uh, an abandoned place, a, a building, and be there alone, and start shouting, and see the vibration, the echoing, and everything else. Go into a uh, room full of people and start to try to find a voice. You will not, because there are other people representing other ideas or and other opinions. This is what is important to drown these negative thoughts, I mean, people from us. There are other people who are genuinely having love for country, who are nationalists, but their emotions get better of them. They become so emotional because of the things happening and probably they are limited in knowledge. They can easily be sucked in by a narrative and they become um, part of that negative force that, will, that brings us down. That brings us down. There are other people especially in the Gambia right now, that believe that because they support the government party, it's politics for them. Anything that will be negative to the government or that will make the government unpopular, they will try to defend that. Regardless of the greater good, regardless of the national interest, they will have to do that. Either they will be silent or they will go out there even to peddle lies just to, so that they are seen as defending the government. They are not helping the government. But we have those people as well. To the extent of they will go out there to attack people who are genuinely progressive. Who, who, people who are looking at the greater good. There are people out there who are disgruntled because of the failure of the systems. Because of what they want is not happening or did not happen because of they support an entity a party political party or they support a particular leader what they want did not happen they forget about the nation their emotions their selfishness or other things that control them made them prejudice to the truth to the facts what they want to see is anything but what they want. That's something dangerous. And we have seen these things in um, places like Sierra Leone, places like um, Liberia and others, where people would run behind the um, 
um, rebel leader or behind the uh, yes and said without them nobody we used to have in Liberia we had without do no Mondovia without Telo Telo kill my mama Telo kill my papa and we seen that in in, in Ivory Coast we seen that in other countries that's why we should be careful we should draw the line somewhere we should know with our loyalty to party loyalty to leader whatever it is it will come a time it's not about them it's about the greater good at times we should be very careful again not because of we have differences with all these people what do we have in common what's the mutual interest here what is the greater good here we ready to um, feel the discomfort or whatever but this is the fact and this is, should be the, our interest and we go for that that's the only way we come out of this we should be very careful in in out comes something called the progressives out comes something we call progressive guys you just forgive me I know a lot of people are I mean um, commenting and um I appreciate these comments. I do read them after the program. I am just bad at doing two things. That's why I always want to concentrate. But I do go in there and I do take anything that, and, and that, that that's, that's of value or, or, or whatever it is in order to use it sometime, I mean, to do things better. I don't ignore your, your, your comments, just to let you guys know. We should be very careful. There's something called the progressive. You see, there's this notion that people deserve their leaders there's this notion that it's the people that elect their leaders and they have to live with it I completely disagree I know this do come out from intellectual quarters and different things I disagree my 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 position here is every society every country is led by elites we like it or not we accept it or not, every country is led by elites. And when country fails, we have to blame leaders for that. And if I say leaders, I'm not talking about only the politicians. Because we know that every, I mean, we have different sectors in governance. And yes, the leaders are minority, but they have greater influence on our life. Due to the privileges they have, about their education, because of the wealth, because of their inheritance and other things, they have privileges that that they use against the majority. These are the people who have influence. They go to the majority and lie to them to manipulate them. What's the problem with the majority? In most senses, in ignorance, they don't know much. They they are this thing and they can easily be divided according to tribal lines, according to regions, according to beliefs, Islam, Christianity, whatever, beliefs or whatever beliefs they have in order to control them. The elites do that. A minority people do that. That's why I'm, I'm not in belief that the people themselves, no. I, I have this belief that it's a minority of people who are elites that do this. And I will, I will, I will elaborate on this later. Again, when countries, let's look at examples. Why do, you, why do we then credit every development, transformation, and leap forward to leaders? We don't I mean, I mean, give that credit generally to the people. We, 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 we give it to the leaders. When the tiger economy rose up, from the asses after the Second World War. We, 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 we recognize the leaders that led those countries from Malaysia, from Singapore. We recognize the leaders of Malaysia, the leaders of Singapore. Today, we are recognizing the leadership of, of, of K K K Paul Kagame. Why do we not say Rwanda? Rwandans, no. We give it to Paul Kigami. Paul Kigami have a team. Paul Kigami have a people. They are elites. Due to his background in military intelligence, background in the army, background in the, I mean, uh, in the civil war. 
He used that in order to create what, what today Africans and other people credit him for. Remember, it's the same Rwanda. Decades ago, that killed each other. Where wives would betray husbands. Wives would betray their own children because of tribe. It's the same Rwanda that end up coming together. What brought them together? You think the people just met and came together? They were led. I'm not, look, there's a, there's a deeper narrative. I'm not going to the deeper narrative of what Rwanda is. I'm saying that what we see and credit for. I'm going to deeper, I'm not going into, I'm not that person that glorify everything that this, what I tell, what I'm saying is the glorification now, Rwanda, Rwanda, every other African intellect you talk about, hey, you see Rwanda. They have elites. And that's what happens. And in every country, that's what happens. The United Kingdom here. Without distracting, I just want to reference. Right now, what's happening in our parliament? It's interesting. Corruption of the COVID. The, the infighting between, between political parties. Trying to um, determine the leadership of the conservative. The position of the opposition. The people. How the people feel about what is happening with parliament. With parliament dealing with the cost of living and other issues. Interesting. Understand what elites do. Minority. And if you understand, and people don't understand, I'll point to this. There's a group of Asians from the Hindu nationalists supported, which is which is go we go decades ago by Indian government, who are now trying to determine the next Prime Minister of United Kingdom. If we are subsided. If we lack vision, we only think of now. We don't think long term. We don't think of tomorrow. We don't know the possibilities in life. Take it from me. It's possible the next prime minister to be an Indian. Yes, they come a long way because they plan. They come a long way because they have leadership. They come a long way because they are determined. Another day we can talk about that. Just to show progress, how progress can be achieved by leadership. We cannot just blame the people. Go and look at the poverty in India. Go and look at all things. Now, look at how many Indian nationals are running tech companies in the world. Go and look at it. You think it happened by, by mistake? Did it not happen from leadership? Did it not happen from leadership? Go and understand the leadership of, of the Hindu nationalists. Go and see the, um, lead, uh, understand the, the leadership of the, 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 the Hindu, uh, the, prog uh, the, the progressive from the, um, from the, from the, Hindu, uh, from, the con con from the Congress Party, Indian Congress Party. It tells you leadership is paramount in order to have that. We cannot just blame our people for our failure. No. And I'll put it the progressive way again. What progressive people do. And, and, and it's sad we have what we have in Gambia and other countries that fail is the wrong kind of people that label themselves the progressive. I'll give you an example of this. A friend of mine just shared a video about Lebanon. How Lebanon have crumbled. To, this, um, to the point that Hariri, the son of the Hariri dynasty, uh, the, the, the chap that represents the Hariri the dynasty now, Said Hariri, doesn't want to be a candidate anymore. His party was, is not even interested because of, for them, the country is valueless. How did that happen? With everything Lebanon went through, with the strength they took and what they achieved, it's the elites of Lebanon that, that came in with sectarian um, strategy and the Christians, the Muslims, uh, the Christian, even Muslims were divided, Christians were divided, we do Jews or whatever it is and 
they divided the country, they, they came together to say that they governed them together. No, they were failing to pay the tax and doing all those corrupt things and plunging the country into war and war and, and war and war. What happened today? The country is, is bankrupt. The Lebanese are suffering like no other country have ever. Now they are abandoning the country because it's so much work to do. And these are the elites. And they divided the country along what? Sectarian. What does sectarian mean in us is tribe. Instead of when we took our uh, efforts together as people and work together, no, we label and divide along tribe or along regional, uh, uh, regional lines or whatever it is in order to control the narrative and in order to plan the country for their own good. This is what we're going through. Instead of progressive, I give you the same progressive narrative in, 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 in Kenya. The difference is why Kenya did not collapse yet because of the presence, the, the, effic the effective uh, private sector. One thing uh, the government with the corruption and everything with the tribal divide they play is the effectiveness of government in creating a conducive environment for investment and that private sector what is pushing. And because of they have a vibrant private sector, even though the elites, you know, in Lebanon, it was the families the, that owns even everything. They own businesses, private sector and everything. In, in, in Kenya, the politicians own a lot, but because of the private sector own a lot, even the politicians, what they own, they invest and they are competing with the private sector, they become effective. That is what is keeping the country. But they are so divided. Now you see them saying that, oh, they, oh, they we call, calling for reconciliation, the, the two uh, uh, political rivals are coming together. No, it's just a strategy to maintain the narrative. Is it going to survive until they improve in governance, in bringing things together? It will. If they fail with the vibrantness of it, this thing, something will give and everything will be lost. You go to um, Ivory Coast. Ivory Coast, we have seen where they came from. And they're still going to struggle because it's the same elite mindset. Go and look at the leadership of Ivory Coast. Go and look at the succession, I mean, planning in Ivory Coast. There's no planning. Is all determined by other factors. Then, as Gambians, another example very close to home is, let's look at when, when Samuel Doe came to power. Because the word progressive, it's not very used in the Gambia, but it's very used in, in Liberia. From the 80s, Samuel Doe came to power. These progressives, they call themselves progressive. Most of them were in Moja, in other I mean, groups, they are in, uh, mainly f I mean, from the University of Liberia. Most of them have their doctorate, their mass masters in the 80s, I'm telling you. If we look at uh, um, Samuel Doe's government, uh, packed with more graduates than, and more diverse than any government that have ever emerged in, in, in Liberia. But, because most of this progressive came, that, I mean the first government of, of Samuel Doe. Because what happened was, the, 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 the country was governed by the American Liberians and the Congo people. These are two different people. I, I, I can't have time to elaborate. But these are the people from Africa, um, African-American descent. And these are other people who we call the Congo people that's free, free slaves that were captured uh, from Liberia taken to Congo and, and, and returned from Congo. That's why they call them the Congo people. But they came and allied themselves with American Liberians because American Liberians were freed slaves from America. They built a block. And, and the rest were the, the natives and you know that's how they divided and everything was by tribe, everything was by region. And in these natives, the young professionals went to universities, to library, library university, went to America, get their doctorates, come start teaching, they come with their ideologies, but people become communists, capitalists, and every other, I mean, isms, they, they become. They could not come together politically to do anything possible. They're fighting each other. 
Now the the what was left was through the army, and um, um, a coup d'état happened by a native who is from the this thing, uh, one of those tribes who was not educated. By the coup was organized by natives, they did it. But now they needed. That's where the term progressive came in. Progressive people, educated people, to help them to govern. And when the progressive came into government, what they did, they started to fight among themselves again to support in order to control the native soldier uh, soldiers. I mean, I mean to the city. Now they split the soldiers from Kwampa, Kwampa, and and, and to Do, and be, that become untribal lines. Kwampa from Nimba, Do from Grand Jiti County, they become tribal lines. Tribalism again. And this progressive, the Charles Taylor you hear about, the Alanyu Kurma you hear hear about, the every other warlord you heard about, they were in do government, in do cabinet. Selen Ellen Johnson Sale, you heard about the the female president or whatever it is, he she, she was in progressive. They were all called the progressive. They were all in do government. They served do cabinet. And these are the same people that end up because they cannot still come with their ideology, come together, they will end up forming warning factions from the NPFL with this thing and different factions, Alaji Kurma and, and others. And what the warring faction came about, I mean, represents become tribal um, lines from the Kra, the Kru, the, 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 the Gyo, and the Mano, the, 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 the Mandingo, and, and, and in certain aspects, it represented Muslims, represented Christians. Any alliance, even within the one in factions, would split. Charles Taylor, I mean, Princeton, is split because again, I mean, tribal, I mean, politics come into it. They split. Uh, Alaji Kurma and 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 and, and um, Russell Johnson split. They have Yulimo K, Yulimo J, because of tribal politics, and become Christians, become Muslims. You see, this is the history of us then we should be very careful to understand that until the progressives until the progressives become organized and be pragmatic we will not move forward it's pragmatism that things takes things forward people that will look at china from mouse change doom on every other person finally what move them leap forward it's what the pragmatism, where they recognize the what the advantages I call we call it the good of uh, capitalism, they they, they merge it together and they grow. It's the pragmatism I, ideology you have. It's to apply as well. I know we have you will have so many educated Gambians, but how many of them are progressive? How many of them are solution driven? You will be, be, you can belong to a group of Gambians. All of them call themselves intellectual. And they will go for years. Nothing they have ever worked on. And you ask them, they all have expertise of whatever it is. They have opinions on anything. But do they ever come out and draw out the solution of something and see it through? No. But they will be forced to criticize. And they are the first to jump on support illegality in order for them to their position. And it's the same. That's the problem we have here. The progressive are not. Give you an example of the so-called tax award. The tax award. Just show you whatever goes in that country. Look at the people that we should term the progressive. They don't even see the, the, the problem coming to them. The problem coming to the country. People that have everything in that country, they have everything. They have their investment. They have their multi-million dollar company. They have their wives, children, and everything in that country. But they don't value the life they have, their wives and children, the peace and stability, even to think of, we have to do something right. Until the country get plunged, they run as refugees, they lose everything, and they start thinking about what. And what else with their education with their wealth and everything else what country do we have this is that's why i said we don't have those we don't have progressives until we have progressive we'll move on and i'll explain that in in a, in a scenario here later on. and another thing is be 
is about progressive, we should think of an effective government. You see, people say, oh, dictatorship was better. No, because the dictatorship was effective in controlling the power, making sure he has the power or they have the power and making sure they suppressed any anything and, 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 and make sure they gave limited freedom, freedom or no freedom to some, limited to others, and they make sure resources for some. And, and They are effective in doing that, controlling everything. And now you sit down moments, you think that, oh, I was better off under a dictatorship. Just as you say, I'm out better off under slavery. I'm be I was better off under colonization. And it's just because of you lost. But we should be better off as free people, as a sovereign nation, as a democratic nation. We should be better off. That's the f that's the fact. That's 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 the fact because we have seen that more all progressive nations are democratic nations. It's a matter of time. And all the other nations fall for, and they fall all the time. That's what history has taught us. With all the unpleasantness of the, some of the things that happen in democratic countries, we have seen it. People don't flee from democratic countries to, uh, to other countries, no. People flee from uh, wealthy, uh, authoritarian rule countries to, to, to democratic countries. When people flee their countries, they don't go to do anything. They try to run to democratic countries because of the freedoms and the possibilities that they have. Until we determine an effective government, we are in a democracy, but we don't have an effective government. What do we have? We have a ticking time bomb. Any day you can wake up, is gone. That's the fact. People don't want to see it that way, but we, I'm telling you, it's a matter of when, it's not if, until something change. That change, as I said, it, we might have to force the hands of this government in order to make it happen. That's where the progressive comes in. Because you don't want to force, you cannot force the hands through violence. You can, if you do that, you don't expect to have a leader or the leadership that you deserve. It's, it's a big gamble. We can force the hands through what political participation, through what a progressive I mean, um, cooperation, uh, through the minds and of Gambians and come and bring about a change. It's possible and we talk, talk about that also. Richard. Another thing is we Gambians should be very careful. We should understand the importance of our sovereignty. We should be careful of this lame duck situation we have in Senegal. Oh yeah, at least we should have, um, at least we have ECOMOC in the country. ECOMOC in a country does not mean that the country cannot be destabilized. No, absolutely. Foreign force occupation does not mean a country cannot be destabilized. In fact, as I explained here the other day, mission trip, where if this thing stays so long, it's become um, an incentive for others or become it poor it poses a threat to national security itself because it comes with its own problems just as people looked at the case in 1994 and said that the presence of nigerians facilitated the coup there was an argument about that that the nigerians presence facilitated the coup yes people who know would say that look if certain things were done certain way we would not have need nigerians I will explain that later, probably, if you have time. But what I mean is, we can look at many countries that we have presence of, 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 of security forces or foreign forces and what it has created. At times, you can still have a deterrent of a foreign country, deterrent of something without the presence in your own country. These are all strategies a country can think of. But Gambia, we are over dependent. When is it going to be finished? When is it going to be over? How are we going to maintain our, um, and, 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 and what you call it? Maintain our sovereignty. If we said, oh, what a comic have to say, what do we do to determine that a comic serve and end and we say, thank you, we take over? When are we going to do that? Are we not a sovereign state? 
Who is to be blamed if we have a government for five years and that government failed to able to, I mean, reset the button, to make sure we have an environment that we can trust ourselves, trust our citizens in order to govern ourselves? That's a failure then. But do we blame the government alone? No, we blame the progress. The lack of progressive within ourselves, the leadership within ourselves, for organizing ourselves to make sure that government does what it should do, for the hands of government. Because now, again, we should remember something. Lame duck leaders, just as Maki Saleh is now, can, can push and situations might arise in that. What this means is, politicians, end of the day, they are they are, they are head of the command marriage command the military does not act without polit political will without political um i mean leadership and if the political leaders political leaders are not thinking right are not doing right are distracted they are not engaged right then they are not going to lead those troops or that army right we have seen what happened in afghanistan with um uh, america and the Afghans. And uh, I think there's somewhere I need to explain that more. Um, but just to give an example, that in, in case I, I, I missed to talk about this, when Afghanistan fell, they failed because of many reasons. America failed in Afghanistan. Corruption from the American mission itself, the net whatever mission you call them, corruption to the corruption within the Afghan government, the lack of effective governance, the lack, I mean, the, the polarization of Afgan Afghanistan people and all the things and all the failures. It does not happen. It's not that the Taliban were stronger or anything. Yes, the Taliban just hold on to their beliefs and they stay time and knowing that, I mean, uh, the troops are not going to stay forever. Things do change and we should be careful of that. We should be ready for an extra strategy. We cannot just depend, sit down and wait. And I, I don't want to go to, and now there's another issue now where they say ECOMOC is going to expand to um, to Guinea-Bissau. we we'll talk about that another time. Now let's come to the um, issue about the Salif Sajo video. And um, you see, when you want to understand how trouble is, is, is on its way, you see, you have to see the situation. You have a situation analysis, what the situation is like. If any person knowledgeable about security looked at, or with common sense in fact, take his time to look at or listen to Salif Sajjah's video, you should be worried. You should be worried. Tells you the failure of Senegal, failure of Gambia, and what what situation we are creating because of the failure of leadership in Senegal and the Gambia situation they are creating in uh, emboldening Salif Sayo, in emboldening Salif Sayo, and in that video there's an aspect. I, 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 I have observed in that video I am not going to talk about for obvious security reasons. I am not going to talk about. I might share this where, where, where it's relevant. I'm not going to talk about that in open. But I have seen an aspect, on this, I have observations in that video which is very frightening. But that's for another platform or forum. Salif Sajo is given a platform. Okay, why do I say this? You can see the message Salim Sajjah was trying to give. We have given him a platform and um, given him the attention. He has gained that attention. What I mean us, both the Gambia government and Senegal. And I'm going to explain this. They are failing. That's what Salim Sajjah into the position. Now he was interviewed. And what is he doing? He is trying to appease the disgruntled Gambians. That's why we should be very careful, Gambia. We should be very careful, Gambia. I have seen it. I have witnessed it. 
and we, we all have witnessed it with the life or we have seen the videos or seen it in the news. Civil war, it's not a pretty sight and it's not a solution to any problem. The victims generally are children, women, old people, poor people. Yes, they are victims of rich politicians and others. But remember, they are minority. The majority are us. And their victimhood is different. Some might be affected directly, in a way, impacted directly. Some might be impacted directly, but in, in none other aspects. That's why the progressives should think of this. Salif Sadio is appealing to the disgruntled Gambians. Yes, many Gambians are disgruntled for different reasons with this government. But we should always remember this. As that's why I started up with that. It's about patriotism. It's about nationalism. We should not allow anybody to appease us to anything that is not for the greater good. We should not allow our emotions, we should not allow anything else to make us to not be jealous of the peace and stability of that country. That's why we should speak out in a way and manner, hold accountable and everything else. That's why we should not even be quiet to, I mean, be, uh, for the peace and I mean, security of that country. He's trying to appease. Many Gambians are disgruntled from different reasons. Some people are disgruntled because they support the dictatorship. They are still dreaming for the return of the IMF or conditions or whatever it was. Other people, as I said, are disgruntled because of the way the country is. And they are thinking that it's nationalistic even to see start a war. But I am telling you, war is not a solution. There's an easier way to do this. And it's just to organize and have a progressive uh, way of doing things and change can be ensured and we'll, we'll talk about that later. Another thing he's doing and what Salif Sadi is doing, the hidden hand. The hidden hand is something I am not going to talk about. But I am saying that there's a hidden hand. We should be very careful. Under estimation, we should not. But the hidden hand is to be dealt it with by security. Senegal should deal about uh, with that. Gambia should do deal with that. Gambia and Senegal can work together, as I said. Yes, sovereign nations do work together. No country should allow trouble in another country. No country should allow a secession uh, movement in another country because it will destabilize you. But there's a way, and we'll talk about that. But there's a hidden hand. By looking at the video, I can see so many, and some I don't even know, because it, just by video you can tell some of these things. Because I do, I disassociate to avoid even getting interest or talking to certain people about certain things, because it's a democracy, remember that? We live in a democracy now, we should be very careful how much we get involved. As citizens to something, institutions are meant to be dealt with. We, yes, we still have, I mean, but we have to be very careful. And again, it's, it's tiring. There's so much we can do. But again, it's, 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 it involves a lot. That's why I just kind of take a step back. We, we are not in a dictatorship as we used to be. People are free to this thing, and now we should accept people to, to take up responsibility. But what I'm saying is, if I was there, and I know people in the army, Gambia army, I know people in Senegal as it is, if they're not blinded, subsided or anything, they know what is going on there. And I, I don't think they would underestimate some of the things that are hidden out there. But, what did that video tell us? I know people would blame some people some people will blame the gambian soldiers who were there when salif Sadio is making those threats i understand where you're coming from but again that's one thing being a soldier is able to keep your calm i mean you should not react because of you're angry 
you react by using your tactical advantage. What's my tactical advantage now? Do I have a tactical advantage against you or not? No. What's my mission? What's my that's not my mission. I fail. What's my mandate? That's not my mandate. I fail. What's the 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 the, 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 the operational I mean mandate? These are things you need to know. What's the rule of engagement? Soldiers go by that. Not because of someone is saying something that makes them angry. Or, yeah, they will get angry. I bet you some of them were angry. I cannot talk for all of them. I know some of them. But they, should they have reacted in any other way? No. I applaud the soldiers for keeping their calm. They went there for a mission. Their mission was achieved. But at times, to, uh, civilians or others, even soldiers, don't know what else is entailed. That these are things we, we, you have to know. It's a need, need to know basis. We leave it there. But it, what it exposed is where Salif Sajjah want us. Salif Sajjah want us to side with him. What it manifests to is how this um, important the situation have rendered our soldiers. Because technically they are uh, the leadership is not there. One, the, the army, Gambia Armed Forces leadership have failed to, to inform the, or, or to be to make sure the government do things the way they should do. I'm not saying to force them. There's a way they should do advices that they should do and we to show them, look, this is the way it should be done. The situation is not right and is, is, is posing the risk, uh, I mean, I mean posing a threat to, to the security of this country. We should not do it this way. It's showing the failure of Senegal and exposing the situation the way it is. Salif Sajjo is gaining here. Salif Sajjo is, 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 is um, overselling the threat. Yes, I'm, I'm saying don't underestimate the threat, but he's overselling the threat. What I mean, if you know you, what you should know, you should know that too, whatever... Um, Whatever hidden hand he has, it's not much that a sovereign nation should not be able to deal with. It's not much what Senegal could not deal with. No. And again, to prove that hidden hand, if he had the power, he would have controlled territories within Senegal. Territories. He could have said that, look, there will be no voting within this territory because we control here. It's not part of Senegal. Nobody should pay tax in this territory because it's not part of Senegal. It's part of Casamas. He did not have ground, what we call control ground. That's what we have seen in, in Colombia. We have seen in, in, in El Salvador. We have seen in, in Ivory Coast. We have seen in other places. Ivory Coast and um, Soros demarcated the north away from the south. They have to create a buffer zone and the north did not comply with anything the south wants. Because of he had power, he determined for to push, use the grand he hold to go to election. Salif Sajjad did not do that. He doesn't have that capacity. He knows where his strength lies, though. That's why he's keeping it cool this way. He's overselling because of it's 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 it's, it's something that will go to his advantage because of he have to put the fear into Gambians. He have to intimidate Gambians. He have to, at the same time, appease Gambians, the disgruntled Gambians. Be careful with that disgruntledness. <coughs> it should be channeled positively. The end is, if it happen, Gambia will lose. I'm not saying, look, what we lose is greater than anybody will gain. What we lose as Gambians is greater than anybody. That's all I have to say that. But again, what you should look at is geopolitics. What is going on around us? Which is, we talked about the geopolitics before. We, we see what is developing in coup d'etats and other things and other things that are around us. We should be very careful. We should be very careful, careful with these imperialist demarcations, um, uh, the imperialist, um, <coughs> what they call it again, um, interest, strategic interest they have in our resources. 
We have recently, I've pointed that recently we have seen arms coming to the Gambia being intercepted. We have seen arms being intercepted in Senegal. Uh, um, I mean, I mean, arms intercepted in Guinea Conakry coming from different places. And it's not only America we think of, it's not only China we think of, it's not Turkey we think of, India. There are many interest groups now. And it's all about resources. Then when we look at these things, look at that video, these are the things we think of. If anything here, we, sh we don't need the situation. And this situation can be controlled. What, what can be controlled here? And let me come to the adopt, adopt, uh, adopt, adoption of Gambians from, to Senegal. It's, it wasn't an arrest. Um, there's a power of arrest called citizen arrest and other arrests. But in the laws of the Gambia, um, there's prescription on how people should be arrested and where should they should be taken when arrested and how long they should be held on the arrest which are charged, who, should, who can arrest them, who can keep them in custody. Everything is defined in the laws of the Gambia. Now, if three Gambians are taken away, arrested in the inside the Gambia, taken away out of the jurisdiction, um, that's a problem. That's a problem of about rights of people. That's a problem about rule of law. That's a problem about infringement of our uh, our self sovereignty, undermining the sovereignty of the Gambia. Um, that's a problem of undermining uh, the efforts of the security sector. Um, and that's a problem of empowering the the South side of movement because these are the things that they thrive on. I am not going to talk about certain things. I learn about the reason, uh, the reasons for arrest and reasons for taking for to to Senegal. I'm not going to touch on that. I've learned about certain things, but I'm still looking at. And I want to leave it at that. Um, but that's why I said at times, um, it's not justified. It's not needed. But there's reasons advanced, and I'm going to leave it to that. Um, it's another forum we can talk about that. But what did this expose? Now, we are playing into the hands of the, the rebels. Salif side. We are playing in the hands of Salif side. Because what this did was make Gambians angry. Citizens angry. These citizens are not APRC. These citizens are not supporters of Gambia. These citizens are not unique to any tribe or region. They are Gambians. They are angry because of what they see. Because they are Patriotic Gambians, patriotic, and they understand that it's wrong. No Gambian should uh, lose his um, limits. No Gambian should be, I mean, I mean, I mean, rights should be taken, especially by a foreign force, if a foreign country picking up the decision. It's made Gambians angry, and that's what the rebels would want, and they can communicate and to appease this uh, anger in us in order to, 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 to grow. And we'll get to that. I'll explain that later on. Again, this exposes the failure of governance again, both Senegal and Gambia. You see, these hidden treaties, these hidden agreements, hidden bilateral, it's not right. There's a reason in, 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 in democracy we have the check and balance system, where we have parliament have their own powers as a government of government, as an oversight agency against the, um, the authorities and, and, and the executive itself, Represent, as representative of the people. That's why we should take treaties there and issues there to be ratified so that people would acknowledge, people have ownership, the legitimacy of that agreement should be answered. It will be scrutinized to make sure it's right. People will remember the word hot pursue. 
how did we know about that after incidents happened in the Gambia? A Gambian, a Gambian was shot in Basse, chased from wherever it is shot in Basse, and dragged from Basse, taken back to Senegal. The outpour did not come from some quarters. You see, this will happen, and that's why we should be very careful what we, we, we make sure we are patriotic. And look for the justice, look for the greater good. We had about the port pursuit. How did it come about? Just as we still conflicting, is it economic? Is it Senegalese forces? Because people that know, as I, I, I know, it's what presence in Fony are Senegalese forces under a bilateral. But now they are conflicting with it's going on confusing Gambian small. People are calling to oh, can you explain this to me? Oh, what is, is it a common? Is it this? What is it? And these are educated people who are struggling because of even news prints or whatever is sending the same news. What it does is explain this failure. We should not do things that way, we should do things right. It's showing that. The, for the Gambian National Army, they don't even have a SOP. Within nowhere for that matter. I can say they don't even have a mandate. How can you have a, something nearly 7,000 soldiers or more? Train, arm, and everything else. It should be a national army, but they don't have a mandate inside the Gambia. They don't have a mandate to act on this. That's how they feel. In every operation, every mission, every de deployment or anything, you have an operational standard purchase. You have a rule of engagement. You have all this. These things are mastered. These things are rehearsed. You go to area, you have a priority of what things do you live in. You have vulnerability that you, you recognize. But do they have all this? This is exposed what problems we have in that area. It tells us the lack of strategy. What's our security strategy? You see, they have all these fancy documents that tell you about we have the security policy, strategy, security, this, security, this, but is it applicable? What is, do people familiarize themselves with it? Is it applicable? Are people applying? Are people acting on it? What's the point of having different bases everywhere in the Gambia when something happened, they cannot engage? Something like that, they could not engage the way they should engage. Why bring in Senegalese soldiers inside their territory? In their jurisdiction to do what? What is the rule of engagement here? How are they working together? Why are they having two different bases? Gambian here in in Kandela area, Senegal is here in Buyam. What are you creating here? I'm not gonna tell you what can happen here because no, but I'll tell you it's not. These are the situations that develops. There's no standard operational procedures, no strategy, security strategy. No rule of engagement. Now we are creating an ambiguity. Where ambiguity uh, happens, it's bound to be exploited. Call a loophole, whatever you call it. And the, the rebels are operating within this environment. Who is uh, it helping? It's helping the rebels. It's not helping Senegal. It's not helping the Gambia. It's helping the rebels. And it's posing a threat which can impact badly. And give the rebels and this is why we facing what we're facing today then arresting gambia uh, picking up gambians not arresting them adopt, adopting them taking them away to senegal was even not right for senegal what are they gonna gain from that even though if if let's if they have reason for whatever it is they should not break the procedure. They should not break, break, break uh, the, 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 they should follow the rule of law. If they are not comfortable in operating within the Gambia, then that tells them the relationship they built five years with this government, it's not what a relationship. If they cannot trust Gambians, if they cannot trust the Gambian, Gambia security sector, if they cannot trust to work with them, if they don't, cannot trust those to hand over uh, suspects to these people to integrate them, uh, to investigate, do investigations, they cannot work with them, all that, then we have a problem. They have a problem. We have a problem. 
this thing. These are issues we need to iron out. These are the things we need to understand. The we are playing into we are playing into the into the hidden hands of the rebels. By doing things wrong, we are opening a can of worms. This is why today we have Salif Saib addressing Gambia and Gambians. We create a platform by default for Salif Saib to address the nation and putting fear into Gambians and and or, I mean. And and, and 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 for any patriotic citizens and soldier undermining the, the our sovereignty that's an insult for Salif Sadio to have the audacity to threaten us it's it given a platform to Salif Sadio to better important as if I'm not saying we underestimate his threat there's a level of it and they are professional to do that and I can do that but what I'm saying is as if no, he's a faction and he's not controlling ground in this thing. I explained that before in, uh, uh, in Kasama's. And he is trying to emphasize on Kasama's sovereignty. Kasama's is not sovereign. Kasama's is part of Senegal. If you have an ideological uh, beliefs that or uh, philosophical beliefs that you support a separatist movement, that's yours. But it is not the, the truth. We all know what the truth is. We move on from there. And this is helping the insurgents. Let's let's put this again. Let me put this again. I'll keep on saying it. I will keep on repeating this. Two things, two um, parallels we have here. Insurgency, counterinsurgency. Insurgency is what the rebels do. Dissidents do. And the government state what they do is to counter that insurgency now how do you counter an insurgency insurgency is about winning hearts and minds of the people by using um gorilla tactics and this gorilla tactics is not like uh, why we call it gorilla tactics it's not a conventional warfare gorillas you know how gorillas in in course and uh, withdraw and so on how they uh, i mean touch here move their measure here that's what they do. They use guerrilla tactics. They use insurgency, and what carried the insurgency is what many um, a few things factors I need to explain here is to win the hearts and minds of people. And who are those people? The people they con come in contact with, people around the vicinity, people they interact with, the people that they want to win over in order to influence them. They win their confidence. How do they do this? By deception. They deceive them into giving them protection, deceive them in, 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 in making, uh, making them to empathize with their cause. This is what, I mean, he is messaging. Salu Salu was messaging. We should be very careful. And this deception at times is not only messaging, it's the, an act. You see, I'm not going to explain how they act to do that. Because again, I'm responsible here. I mean, not to do that, but so, rebels know that, soldiers know that. And some other people who read uh, these things don't know, know that, who read in, uh, the histories of insurgency know that. They create a situation in order to get heads knocking each other. They want Gambia and Senegal to be in problem. They want Gambia to forcefully remove economic without a strategic planning without having something in place to do it hastily so that they can have an opportunity they will they will want disgruntled gambians to support their ideology they are these things that i mean to empathize with them that's what they do they use deception in order to achieve that by a physical act or by messaging and so on because that's how they will. because what that deception what that hearts and mind does is give them two things give resources and give them intelligence because these people, they will tell them, oh, these people have been here, this is happening, that's happening, this. They will have them resources, they will have them mobilize things, they will have them move. They can even join them and to fight. It, it happen in every insurgency, that's what they do. They get their support and everything from, from the people. 
they get protection in fact by pretending giving protection for people but not knowing that this, those people are protecting them that's why they say they can there's they the way they use a strategy to use the people as human seals without people even knowing that they've been using as human seals because governments would be scared to to create a situation where escalation will happen and this is a scenario which is happening now now the government will have a dilemma or oh, we should be very careful not to escalate this because of what the gambian People living around those areas would be displaced and other things and will be a destabilizing factor and so on. You see, they are we are playing into their hands. This thing should not have happened. We should this is what they do. And and this and they get information from the people that live around them, they give them protection, they make sure these people are, I mean, they, they help them, no, no insecurities like people coming to steal from them and others or hustle them, and the people will see that the rebels as a savior. But then knowing that the rebels are using them in this manner and so on. And they will start to rely on the rebels, start to give information to the rebels, start to even feed the rebels and other things can happen. I'm not saying it's happening in the Gambia. I'm saying this is how insurgency works. Now, a counter-insurgency is to the government to work effectively. Governance. Counter-insurgency, again, is to counter the hearts and mind operations that rebels do. You counter that by doing what? Winning over the the inhabitants within over the people how do you win over the people as government is effective governance how effective governments happen is by initiative by policies programs that impact the people's life to make them better to make them secure to make them safe not to rely on any external agency or anything else that will use them in order to to, to win their confidence to uh, uh to influence them in any other way or how that's the main important part of you see and through that how do you gain that information intelligence you use that it gives you information intelligence and everything in order to combat the rebels on that and there's an aspect of physical force there's an af aspect of an effective operational um forces that will get and hit where it hurts to stop but um another measure is to stop any resources just as wind has a that goes to the rebels. That's why, again, the importance of stopping the timber trade should not be justified. Gambia cannot justify our existence by doing something illegal or using illegal means to, to, to operate as a state or nation. And for myself and any progressive person who know that, cutting down the trees, uh, the, these big trees that take 30 years to 40 years to, to get to the majority where they are, it's not a solution to our problems. What does this do is going to harm us more. Climate change, I mean, for environmental uh, destruction that happened, the, the, the destabilization of the ecosystem and, 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 and global warming and every other thing. The problems with wind erosion, we all have seen what the winds did the other time. The damage it done to I mean, people. And that the wind was coming from the northern part. Imagine now if the, the southern part is taken off. Even the mangroves, we need that. We need every other thing here. We need to use them sustainably. Do we think that feeding the appetite appetite of China and India and other countries from Casamas would is sustainable when we don't replace them? It's not. And now it's for government to do that. You know, the government would not. That's why we hold the government ac accountable again. These are done by policies, enforcement. They are using the infrastructure of the Gambia to do that. Get it off. Stop them using the port. Stop Gamb Gambians and Senegalese and other Indians and other Chinese, other national trading onto this within our condition. Bring out legislation that stop it. We used to have a legislation uh, during, during the um, Jawara attack that stopped the charcoal burning. Charcoal was scarcity. It was effective. We start to re have a reforestation program with the help of the German government, then with the Cyprus government. We have the Kabafita, we have the um, I mean, uh, Kafuta, we have the Genoi, we have the different locations that where we plan in Malina and other things. These are things that we need that will empower 
we can have the, the, the entire belt of the boundaries of Gambia and uh, Senegal in both sides, the north and south, to be to revolutionize. These are projects that will bring in benefits. To do all these things we should do. Do you think then people, rebellions will happen? If the rebels want to fight for the free, freedom, let them try it politically. But we should not allow any criminality. It's a criminal act. But we are um, failing in that. And um, I'll come into how do we this escalate because we avoid an escalation by this escalating what strategies these are things we're talking about senegal senegal have a military supremacy and everything superiority against gambia against salu sadio and his movement I'm not even going to say MD, uh, MFDC because the, the other, others are engaging in, in many ways. Gambia should draw out and make it clear. The army, I'll come to that. Who is to blame? Us. The army by now should be trusted. If it's not trusted, we blame ourselves. We have five years. What the hell we've been doing to not trust our army? The leadership has to be held responsible, accountable. Are we going to blame Gambian people for that? No. We blame the leadership. Well, that's where I'm coming again. The leadership of the army. The leadership of the, of the police. The leadership of Did they deliver what they should deliver? The leadership of the security sector reform. But who appoint them? Who can sack them? Who, can, who appoint them? Who, who keep, keep tap on them? The oversight bodies, parliament and other things. This is what we have asking for. Then we need a strategy that we organize and prepare ourselves for eventual security of the country to be taken care of by Gambians. We have to do that. We have to have that. We cannot just rely on economic or foreign forces. There should be a day we should know a tangible, we should have a roadmap to tell us. That's how we can measure. We have to measure to know when this thing can be concluded or how much we develop, how much we achieve. But security sector reform, you know, we have in this policy, we have in the policy, we have in that workshop, we have in that workshop. It does not mean anything. Tangible. Signposted roadmap in 20. 2023, this is what's going to happen. This is what is likely to be achieved. This is going to be achieved. We achieve that. We move on this 20. This is what's going to be. This is what's going to be replaced. If the government is not doing that, progressive forces within the Gambia, Gambian progressives should be able to bring that to political means, engagement, and other, any other progressive means to bring that. That's something to be discussed again. The situation right now should be this escalate. But that does not mean that we should be signed out or acting in a way that we are scared or, or this. No. A state should operate like a state. A Gambia should be bold enough to come out and operate like a state. And our relationship with Senegal and anything we do should be defined to the interests of mutual interest. And as I said, we should be very careful. We cannot just say that because of Senegal or this, or this thing, we have to rely on them. Look, um, Afghanistan relied on America. What happened? How many countries rely on other superior countries? What happened? Countries do get distracted. Countries do things get things wrong. Senegal are human beings. Their government are human beings. Their home government have interests. Their government can make mistakes, especially Macky Sall and what he's facing now. He's a lame dog. We have to take responsibility as Gambians to determine this. We should be able to reform our forces. We should be able to, 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 to govern well. As a nation, this is not only holding government accountable, we should, but we should hold ourselves accountable. What are we doing as progressive people in order to determine this to ensure it happens? What are we doing to avert anything, I mean, I mean getting to a level that we will be destabilized because we are all going to suffer? We are all going to suffer. That's why I said the progressive should do something to make sure it happens. We cannot just rest and blame the people and blame few uh, politicians. 
We'll get to that again. We should have a strategy that our security operates upon. They have their priority. They have a strategy. They have, should have a standard push, uh, operational procedure applied. Whenever they have a mission, whenever they have a deployment, wherever they are strategically positioned, we just don't send, oh, because of the Kiankas don't have a, a, a barracks, we put a barracks in Kiank. Badimukas don't have a barracks, we put a bad, uh, this thing, Fonyinka don't have a barracks, we put a bad, this thing, Kombonkan don't have a barracks, we put a barracks, no. That should be based, deployment should be based on the need. And then, when we deploy them, they should have an operational uh, strategy. And the, uh, the operational strategy should be underpinned by a standard operational procedure. But what do we have? Soldiers everywhere. Travel the length and breadth of the country, we have damaged soldiers everywhere. Then what's the point? These things should be made clear. When people talk about, or oh, uh, this is, do we? I mean, when we see permanent sector sign letters, I mean, I mean, giving clearance to, I mean, uh, timber smugglers, we call them smugglers. You legitimize that. When the port authority and others, where's those revenue going to? Government knows about revenue. But there's many ways you measure act activity, how they happen. You measure it by revenue. You can tell. And these things are need to be stopped. This part, they, they, that would be part of it. And um, if we are not careful, and give you an example that we cannot rely on for foreign troops, as I said, um, we have seen the situation in Afghanistan, in the Niger and well. They have to pull out because you cannot determine. The only way you can determine how long they stay is when you prepare yourself and have an engagement and, and make sure it happens. If not, if you just rest on them, they, they determine when they're going to go. They will want to go tomorrow, they go. I, I explained in the Gambia, Senegal, we had a confederation, a confederation, signature, everything, stronger than what we have now. When it suits them, they just walk away. They just walk away. The, other thing is, we remember the situation in the Coast. Um, it escalated and it started from what? I want governments to think about this. Ivoco started from politics. Who is to stand and who is not qualified? Who is qualified? A, a variety? The policy of uh, pure Ivorian, I mean, went on to become trying to stop a candidate who created polarization, candidate from the north, the south, southern candidates want to stop candidate from the north, who is likely to win elections or to give them competition, Wathara. And it went into the other things that were um, under the radar. And the separatist movement started this way. The North started to fight. The little day members who were in the, in fact, it was a couple that, that came out to lead the North. And the North empathized, obviously with support from other allies within the sub-region, every coast for that matter, Burkina Faso supported the North, the South, get support from Ghana, and this, yeah, that's, that's what normal happened. That's why I say you have to know the geopolitics. And where it ended up, I mean, a civil war. That's why we should not underestimate what is happening. As effective government, as, as people, we should ensure we do something about this. But we should be careful we have a ticking time bomb in that country. I keep on saying this. And what is the ticking time bomb? A weak governance. A weak governance. Um, again, look at the video of Salif Saiden. Still now, the president of the Gambia have not addressed the Gambia on this major issue. Displa internal displacement and everything else. The sovereignty, a risk of sovereignty and everything. He did not. Now we have a rebel leader addressing in the Gambian South. What does that say? 
how ineffective that government is. How that effective that government is when Gambian citizens will be pulled out to be taken to another country to be investigated. Where is the police, Inspector General of Police? Where is the uh, uh, Interior Minister? Where is the Defence Minister, for God's sake? None of them will come and address anything. For almost a week. The minute we knew about where is Parliament? The minute social media knew about it and agitated, apparently yesterday they were returned. I saw something somewhere. I'm not sure how far through it is. I think they are returned yesterday, three of them. And people were been talking about two. It is three. Talking about Alcala on a police passing. Another person was there. Again, shows you the weakness of governance. But the weakness of governance, we have seen it in many, 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 many examples. But it's a fact. But a pluralized society. We are pluralized here now than ever. A pluralized society. Society, plural society in many aspects, not only, uh, and I know when I say pluralized, people just go straight for pride. No. Pluralized um, in the sense of something we don't talk about Gambia is class. Or people think, I mean, if you can categorize that class, or, or, or there's no unique way of saying it. Just as when you have the taxpayers being rewarded. That's an example. Taxpayers rewarded. Who are those taxpayers being rewarded? The people that think, or, or the people that are the biggest tax or largest taxpayer. But you will find out if you had done an investigation properly, those are the people who are not paying their right amount of tax. Those are the people that are giving kickbacks to tax officers. They can give a million millions to tax officers so that they can save millions and millions. These are the people organized for an award. And these people think they are progressive, they are, they are, they are okay. And I tell them, these people are the dumbest because they, they, everybody has to lose, but they will have to lose everything. Some people have nothing in, in the sense of property, property or material. Only thing they have to save is their life. And why the other people are not being awarded? How many teachers awarded? How many soldiers awarded? How many policemen awarded? How many cleaners awarded? How many market women awarded? How many sub, small shopkeepers awarded? None. And it's been going for four years. And the president was there. To address that or accept and they're having a, a, a celebration for that being awarded how much how much millions is don't find out how much million did anyone ask about how much was spent to organize that that's what we have in the gap here the half and the half knots the pluralizing now we have a begging so many people begging the sufferings and everything and again we have a pull 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 political polarization we don't have, we have political parties and every kind of this thing, civil society. Nobody can tell you who are those working together to create a greater good. No. In fact, they will go to oppose each other. Politicians in the outside of government will oppose each other. Civil society will oppose each other. Personalities will oppose each other rather than, in fact, oppose government. That's what we have. That's a pluralized society. That's a ticking time bomb. We have disgruntled people hung over from different uh, areas. Disgruntled. Some people rightly so. Other people because they're still in love with the dictator. Yes. Some people they have the but disgruntled is this important. Be careful how you channel that. But they are there. This political class we have, which don't work together. Everything, why it failed the way it is, it's not only Baroque, it's part of our problem, it's our political class. We don't have a, a political class that think as an anti-establishment, that work together in order to, to, to make things work. They, they don't work together to make sure the hands that is wrecking this country is whole, and the hands that would I mean, move the country forward is empowered. That's what uh, I mean, opposition should do. We don't have that. 
that's that's again part of what create what is part of this taking time up. This empowered youths, the greater part of our population are youths. They are disempowered. Look at the back way. Look at the people coming out from the back way. Look at what um, the situation of youths in that country, especially in the urban areas, from rural to urban migration. So look at how. I mean, I mean, I mean, the situation is this are taking time. You think what's going to happen with these people happen? I mean, something happened. The failure of reforms. The failure of reforms. I cannot overemphasize that. But specifically in fact, the security sector reforms. These are taking time. And when we say the security sector reform, people just look at physically what's people in the uniforms. Do we know how many Gambians have left the army since Yaya Jemi came to power to now. Do you know how many Gambians left the army from when Jem uh, Barrow came to power to now? Do you know why I take these measures? Um, the time of Jawa, most people that left the army now are, are old and they are, uh, they are less toxic, they are more, they are less temperamental, they are more calm because they are in their mid 50s going to their 60s, you know, and so on. Because, I mean, but this, I'm talking about young people who are active, who are, I mean, have every other temperamental thing about a soldier or, or a veteran or whatever you call them. How many of them? Do we know how many of those people are, are disgruntled about the system, entire system? How many of them are suffering? We, we, we know this. Do we know this? We can gauge some of these things. How many of them went through the back way? Can tell you. How many of them came back? How many of them are living there, being security, working as security guards, earning three thousand, four thousand dollars? How many security guards are earning ten thousand dollars? And you know, we know earning ten thousand dollars is even nothing in the country now. It doesn't take you well. Now, all these people are part of that poverty, uh, taking time on we should think about. And the other ticking time bomb is the what's happening in the uh, in the geo uh, um, the the sub region, the politics which happening, all the things that happening, and the narco trade happening between Gabi. See all the narco trade. Go and look at the so incident in Bissau. They still talking about that air plane that left the Gambia owned by a Gambian and went to Bissau. It's part of the problem. And the others ones we have with Nakotri, these are taking time off. What do we do? As I said, the solution would be from progressive forces. Problem with Gambia, we don't have progressives. And um, just as in the case of Liberia, what we have is opportunists that masquerade as progressive. They jump in, just as though took over progressive jump in. And they, that's where they end up. And this is the same thing they happen. The progressive, we don't have progressive. They only go in, most of them will run in to call up. They are part of civil society. No, know because they are better to be liberal civil society because they earn more from civil society than their potential to do anything else. Some will tell you they are journalists or they are uh, part of the press corps, whatever it is. No, it gives them more status, give them more privileges, give them, they are better off to be called journalists or be part of that fraternity. But they don't go to be journalists because of they, they believe in journalism and they are doing what it takes to be a journalist. No. Gambia is freed and technically there is no other threat of our journalists but what's the quality of news. Yes, we have few. But generally, it's just a way of keeping a lifestyle. We talk about, I mean, I mean, I mean, technocrats. We don't have technocrats. Go and look at their policies. Go and look at what they look after, uh, what they implement. Go and look at the road networks in the Gambia, how bad they built, how much it costs. I mean, this is, we, the general world, the technocrats that do the work are seldom leaders. You have good doctors. You have young people, educated doctors, dedicated nurses, dedicating all these technocrats, dedicating hospitals in other places, but they are failed due to what? The leadership in the industry, in the medical, in the, dent in the, de the dentistry. Just as we got good soldiers, 
at different level, but they are failed by the institutional leaders. And, and orders and orders. That's not progressive. We have progressive, I mean, we have people, an educated class, doctorates, masters, whatever you call them. Do they ever come together for a solution? Until we start looking at that, be active, not just to stand there to blame and to come with solutions and walk through those solutions. Gambia should have an intelligence here that works. Just as we have Senegal. And why I said the progressive? The, it is the hand that forced the government to do good and find an approach, a nationalistic approach, in order to, 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 to move the country forward. And in that case, where I will conclude, would to take Senegal as an example. That's what I mean about the progressive. Now, look at the situation in Senegal. Again, I'm coming back to their local government elections. What approaching the local government elections, they have seen everything. Worse than Gambia have seen. They knew that the elections were going to rig. They knew that the incumbent was using incumbent power by, in fact, dismantling government many times, reshuffling cabinet. He did that, reshuffling people around him and everything else. He, they did that. He did that by using money, by using petrols, going around giving money, by using the tribal card, by talking about tribe, by doing all that in different stations, by going for the opposition in a manner to try to arrest them. We have seen the Sonko, we have seen the uh, mayor, mayor of Dakar now, we have seen the former mayor of Dakar, we have seen Karim, we have seen other people being tried to put in prison. We have seen the other opposition being given money to be, or given jobs, I mean, taken out of the, uh, um, this thing. But, what did the progressive do? Yes, PASTEF was the political party. PASTEF was the platform. But they gravitated towards PASTEF in order to build an anti-establishment. That anti-establishment, what it did was to bring people some from the media, we have seen media people run for elections, some from civil society and others to build a form of a coalition, a strategic alliance, in order to approach the problems. They realized that in order to stop um, Makisal is to come together. In order to stop the violence, in order to stop the destruction, in order to stop Senegal being destabilized because of the interests of Macky Sall and his French masters, is to empower the youths by leadership. The progress, they are called, those are they called the progressive. And the others we don't hear. Senegal have intellectuals who would be behind the scenes, who doing, helping these people. Mobilize finances, helping with intellectual property and other things that help start strategies and so on. And they become better organized and they went into the elections. And they make the elections a referendum for Macky Sall start time. If Macky Sall now have a bigger problem now. Now that's what it stop. That's a deterrent. Time to deter Macky Sall to go for the third time. They strategized and went for all the big cities. And they won all the big cities they went for. Dakar, Chess, Kaula, I mean, Ziganso, go on. Kola, they went for it. Even though Maki won more seats local government, but the seats they won are more strategic. There are more populate, pop, population, uh, the population density. If the results of the election was determined uh, as the president election, Macky Sall was going to score 33 percent. He would have, he might even had the problem of going a third, third round, second round, depends who else is running. You see, that's how they did it. Now, Macky Sall is more scared, even though he delayed these elections so much, trying to weaken the, take, give him time to weaken the opposition, the entire establishment came together to strategize this. Now they, 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 they are controlling him by creating an environment 
that youths and most of the candidates are youths, women and youths, and went after the establishment. They went after former ministers, they went after ministers, they went after mayors and all those powerful people who are alive. The same thing we complained in the Gambia was happening in Senegal. Money was pumping, everything else. Makisal's own brother had to lose the elections. With every day, tried different strategy. They moved voters around. They, they, they suppressed the vote. They tried everything. These people went out there, engaged the uh, people, uh, uh, youths and the people, and they came out. Gambia, until we start to think this way, we are not going to avoid the violence that is coming because we have an effective government. As I said, we have a ticking time bomb. I've labeled all that. But the solutions would have to come through us by having a progressive force that would come together, bring our national, um, a national approach to things. What's stopping from a progressive force in the Gambia right now to bring some elements of the establishment together or to approach uh, the National Assembly to bring about this issue of and sorry, the government put out a strategy and work out an, a roadmap that will determine the end of economic state. We don't need to fight. The government to ensure reforms are done for the security sector, to have a roadmap to tell us what is achieved, when it's going to be achieved, and when it's going to be confidence enough for this thing to happen. We can do that in many, many areas. Why can't we have a progressive force that tell us about stopping this timber trade, in which is not to our advantage, and how to bring out a progressive policies? Just as when Sadauda did, stop the charcoal burning. I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, I called, it was called the Banyan Declaration. I mean, that was very progressive. Before we talk about climate change, he was talking about that. The flora and the fauna, the biodiversity and others start to have projects I and mean, initiative for I mean go and ask people in Kafuta, the president of the Kafuta I mean um, forest uh, tree project how much it helped Kaf people from Kafuta go and ask people in Birkama how the Birkama Manja uh, uh, forest project went on and other uh, in Kiel or other places it happened and this time even can be done better and because doing better, I can tell you, the, the is, uh, companies might even come and give resources in order to, to offset their carbon, uh, carbon dioxide emissions. There are many things that we can do from that. These things can, Gambia can take a lead with Senegal to, to, to work together in order to benefit from these uh, grants going around on, 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 on these things. We need a progressive force to think about that. I conclude, and people that come late, please listen from the beginning. You will get um, the entire this thing. I cannot summarize everything. But what I'm saying here is, until we have a progressive um, force, we are in trouble. Because we have an ineffective governments, government. And because we have this ineffective governance, what is happening around us is bound to con contaminate us from the geopolitics, what's happening around these things, and the situation with the imperialists coming around, with the NACO people coming around, everything else is going to catch us. Because of our government, it's subsided, our government and people who should supposed to be in charge to look forward, to plan, have a long-term vision, and everything. they don't have that. Everything is about when the resources come, how to build more houses, how to escape with this, how to do that, how to do that, what car, what how many women I marry, or what how I transform myself for a woman of this to be envied in this materialistic. That's what we have. And how, I mean, every position of leadership we abuse, be it imam, be it priest, be it whatever it is, we abuse in order just to get what we want, um, I mean, for ourselves. This is where the problem is. Thank you guys and have a good afternoon. Thank you.